Jeff, welcome back. Today we're going to have a little channel update. Um, I guess we're going to see like what's the state of the channel, where do we want to go, and and so on. So there's, I feel like there's a lot of things I want to get covered, but it's hard to find the time while also juggling work and um, the many goals that I have. But we'll try to um, make some sense of it here today. So this might be like a kind of rambly video, but also we're going to do some more analysis of the game we played yesterday. Um, just because I saw a comment with their thoughts on what happened after the game, so I want to respond to that. Um, so first thing on the agenda is um, the Coaching Non-Wall Physics series has ended. He's been playing more offline. And so since I don't have like data of like the games or seeing like their tactics progress because I just kind of went dark on chess tempo, it just made sense. Um, we both agreed to just um, not continue the series. Um, there is an option of trying to find a new student, but um, for now, I think I will wait on that and just try to build out more of the instructional content. And I, I probably will bring it back at some point, but it would also be greater if I can bring it back with more of the other content I want to make already created. Because I've been talking about like the Blender Check series a lot. And I just haven't um, done it partly because I was working on this series. So um, so now without having a student, I can fully focus on the Blender Check series and also just getting like this web page out. Like I know people can find a link in the description for some of the videos, but there's going to be a lot more on here. And this is going to eventually cover all of my chess improvement notes. And um, I don't just want to throw everything out there just because it's not all organized and I'm not sure like who needs what exactly because I feel like the lower rated you are the more tactics are going to be important but you definitely see a lot of like opening stuff and strategy stuff all over and and because there's so much information out there I want to make it like really clear on what you should focus on depending on your rating and then um, and also when you do enough of the tactics work what other options do you have? Because you don't want to just jump into just openings when you haven't done enough tactics work because you're just going to blunder pieces and that'll stall your progress for a while. So um, some more will come on this and I will I'll definitely be starting to work on the blunder check series pretty soon. Um, and let's see, so that's pretty much it for the non all physics stuff. In terms of my personal goals, like as a chess player, I'll say um, I do kind of want to try to become a national master one day. I don't really know if I will get anywhere close. I haven't been to going to tournaments, and there's no immediate plans to go to tournaments, um, at least until like a year or two. So we'll see where I am, where I'm at that point. But my main goal um, was always to try to become the best at Puzzle Rush. And right now my best is 43 done like 18,000 attempts. I actually have probably around 14,000 attempts on my old account before I closed it to create this one. Um, and also there's some people that'll, they'll restart, they'll reset their history. So I know like Ray Robson, he used to have a whole lot more attempts and then eventually like his attempts got restarted. So the number you would see on his profile isn't like accurate, I don't think. But, um, but trying to memorize the top rated puzzles, it doesn't really improve your chess as much when you're memorizing um, the higher rated puzzles, like in the 3000 and stuff and above. Those are more suited to calculation training, kind of like how I was recommending not all physics to do the chess tempo. Like that kind of attack is where you want to just sit down and really try to calculate. But, um, but the thing is, when you're becoming like the best at Puzzle Rush, um, the way to do it is just to... Uh, let's see, where is it? Custom mode. It then set this to like a higher number and there's going to be lower amounts of puzzles at higher rating ranges. And that's how it's possible to um, for stronger players to memorize all the puzzles because they have good fundamentals so they can do a lot of the lower rated puzzles because the patterns just kind of repeat themselves. And, um, and so yeah, so I just haven't been... Uh, at one point I was doing a thousand puzzles a day and I was and that was when I was putting videos where I do 500, like 600 level puzzles in a session and upload to YouTube. So I was awake, making my way up through all the puzzles in order of rating. And um, and so I don't think I will 
I don't even know if I would have a chance to qualify for the Puzzle Battle World Championship this time, but the main goal would be to try to win it um, the next year. So, so I'm guessing early 2023 we'll have one. So early 2024, I want to be among the best in Puzzle Rush. So that's kind of my personal goal. Also, what kind of distracted me was one day I started streaming and then someone asked me to like take a look at some of the end games. And I've just been addicted to the end games again. So they actually changed them a bit where they will um they will randomize things a little bit more. So so there's like it's not just one position for each for each thing. There'll be like five or six different positions that it'll start if I just press start, it's gonna change to some other position. Yeah, and so they kinda just like flip the board and all that stuff. It makes it kind of more annoying in some sit in some situations. Cause there's still like a luck element of it or if you can predict where the pieces will be on the first one it's like there's a lot of restarts that happen but i've actually been maintaining quite a big lead and actually picked up some new end games there are also some people that have um that have caught up to my level in some of them so like the two bishops mate there's like some tough competition like this person is trying to um really take a lot of the records down um but so far I've been prevailing and even today like the queen mate this person got 10.7 today which is their best and so um and my best was 10 earlier today but since I saw this I decided to to try harder and I got 9.7 so I'm trying to maintain the lead over that but eventually it gets um pretty tough so so that's what I've been kind of distracted with as well outside of the coaching non wall physics stuff and at some point I'd hope to get like all of the records, at least to be able to get all the daily records at least once or get like more of these 90 day records. So I have most of the ones they can do under a minute, but then all of these, I have to um, do some more work to learn. And it's just a matter of time. Like I don't want to try to rush myself doing, I'm just taking my time and um, keeping up with stuff. But I have put a few more stuff up. And I've really been making videos of them, um, partly because uh, since the competition is getting better, like it'll just be easier for people to compete with the records so it's like you wouldn't expect grandmasters to just give up a lot of their opening prep just for nothing so it's kind of similar to that where i kind of maintain an advantage just because people don't know what lines i'm using but there's some type of competition or something that comes up eventually like those chess played quicks that i can't believe i missed the end game one of that like i don't know when it was but um i found about it out about it later it happened during a time where i'd quit the end games um, but, and nobody ended up telling me, like, Jess.com didn't tell me that this was happening or anything, but that would have definitely been good for the channel growth, because, like, Andrew Tang was playing in it, um, Naradisky was playing in it, and if I was there to put some records up, I would have had a lot more eyes on the channel, so. So my next chance at blowing up, I feel, would be if I was able to do really well in a puzzle battle, um, world championship, so. So that's kind of my plan. Um, we're actually at like 386 subscribers right now, so which is still all-time high, so that's pretty pretty cool. And so, so yeah, so the end games I want to get better at. Puzzle Rush, I think t early 24, 2024, you'll start seeing me a lot more in, um, in those conversations. So, so let's see. So that's enough of, um, of that stuff, and that's Puzzle Battle. So now on to... Um, comment on the last video so the person I played he left this comment kind of like reflecting on like why he made some of the moves that he made because I, I did point out some things and I said I didn't know what was theory or what wasn't and so a lot of what I noticed was um what was that let me see I have some notes somewhere that I feel like the the theory things so he would you would see a theory move but then he would play it in a position that wasn't the one that he had learned it in so he's trying to apply similar ideas, but because there is something slightly different in the position, it often doesn't work. And that's the thing that gets a lot of people into trouble. It does help too. Um, like if you understand plans in a pawn structure, a lot of the times, even in new positions, you would still play those same moves. It's just that it's kind of tricky to know when you can trust your intuition and when you can't. And so the solution for that is whenever you're in a new position, you just have to assume this is completely different and even though you think this might be the answer you have to actually calculate and see does it still work and that's kind of less with tactics as well because if you memorize a lot of basic tactical patterns 
it'll work out for most of them that's similar, but then there will be some that look like a specific tactical pattern, but then it won't be it. So, um, so yeah, and it's hard to say, like, should they be doing a lot of opening work or do they take the approach where, um, which I definitely recommend for anyone, like, even if you're a beginner, if you play a game and then you look up in a database, what, um, just find one spot where you could have improved and then try to memorize that. And then next time you run into that situation, you'll be able to play that move and then, um, and then it'll just like repeat, you'll just extend your opening knowledge one move at a time for each game that you play. And that's kind of like a easier way to keep things memorized. You don't want to just see like, okay, there's this 15 move line into Sicilian, I'm just going to memorize it. No, you just, whatever people play against you, that's what you try to learn, but you don't try to overlearn it, I guess. Um, no, no, maybe I'll make an example of it, but, but anyway, I did annotate this game a little bit, not really like super... Um, serious annotation, but just kind of responding to the comments annotation. And some of this we did look at a little bit um, last time. Let me make sure this is in the scene. But this is just like using chess space now. So I use the, um, a bigger database with a lot of more higher rated games. Because um, before I was just using the chess.com one. And I prefer like the lead chess one or just using chess space than to the chess.com opening database. So, um, I might make a video comparing like different softwares and, and websites. So if you, if you do want to see something like that, let me know what kind of, um, comparisons you like to see, because I can pretty much get access to any chess related thing. And, and I have a lot of experience with pretty much all of them. Um, even chess position trainer, like I used to use that to memorize openings, but now I use like the chess tempo one and like some other website. But so in this situation we go back to this point where I was talking about d6 um, and we look at at the opening database we see that d6 is the second uh, most common move but the score says 47.5 whereas knight f6 says 51.6 and the score is showing like um, whites uh, from white's perspective so um, so basically if you're playing as black then you want the lower number so actually d6 is a pretty good um, move in a position just based on that because it's 47.5% versus 51.6. So white's winning more than um, half the game. So I don't, I don't know exactly how you interpret this, but generally, because um, I don't know how to count the draws or stuff. I guess draws are just count as um, 0.5. But, but um, basically, black does better when they play d6 and there's less game. So fewer people will be prepared for it. So that is um, kind of decent. And also I can sort by Black's ELO and see a lot of more games on this way. So you see like a lot of Carlson games. And he actually, Carlson actually plays Knight F6 a lot of times, but if we go to D6, no, no, this is just because of a transposition, transposition or something, but we do see some Carlson games even with D6. So you can't really go wrong with either. And okay, so let's see, what was the next point? That, so at this point, and actually I'll, I'll just flip the board so you can see it from where you were in the game. So e takes d4 is the most common move, played almost twice as much as um, bishop e6. But notice that white scores 55.4% versus 50% for bishop b6. So um, you played um, e takes d4, and I think part of the reason that this might be not as good is because white gets this uh, strong pawn center. Whereas moving the bishop back, that just, um, that keeps the tension. So like if they take, then you get retake and then the pawn structure is like even, it's not an imbalanced pawn structure. And if they push, you boot a knight somewhere and you're still doing okay, but you're not giving um, white two connected pawns just in the center while you would only have one pawn in the center. So, um, I would say you could go into this line up to here, like if we were to play again, but just um, remember to play bishop b6. So that's like the main lesson I would take away from the opening in this game. And that's really, that's all you would have to know. And then next time someone plays this against you, then you try to learn, okay, well, what did they do? Did they take the pawn? Did they push? And then you learn what to do. You don't really try to say, okay, I'm going to click through moves and see what I should do. Like if you want to do something like that, what you do is you look at bishop b6, and I'm just going to look at um, the highest rated, highest rated players. Um, and actually, before I do that, 
if I just sort by Black's Elo, you see all of these Bishop B6s, even though this is the second most common move, every strong player, like very top player, is playing Bishop B6. Like you have to go all the way down here to find the first Grandmaster playing E takes D4. So you got Aronian and uh, Peter Lyko, who are 2700 playing Bishop B6, and everyone else playing Bishop B6. So even though like E takes D4 is the most common move, just looking at the score and looking at this tells me that you definitely want to play bishop b6 here. Like, you do not want to um, go for e takes d4. Now, I have not read any opening books on this, so I don't really know why people go for it or not. Like, the e takes d4 idea. But the data seems to suggest that you should be going bishop b6. And let's see. So if I look at um, that game, actually, the Ronin game, it was actually a draw. But we just noticed, like, what did they do with their pieces? So pawns... Um, so they took on the center, and they retook back with the knight. So one thing you might think, oh, I'm going to take back with the pawn. That's like a typical move. But notice they took with the knight. And the way to remember this is it's attacking the bishop. Let things trade off, and you turn to this end game. So you have to be comfortable with playing this end game. And, and, yeah, and notice at um, this point, they're threatening to win this pawn. They cannot move this pawn to protect because it's pinned. And that's part of why they developed a knight this way to defend. They could move the bishop, but then that's just moving the same piece again instead of getting their knight developed while also defending the pawn. So even without annotations, it's possible to understand some things about what these um, super strong players are doing. And then um, just kind of notice like where they put their pieces. Notice this is a the only open file, and so black put their rook there. Um, and then they even doubled rooks, so they doubled rooks on open file. So just remember that, like, okay, the queens come off. This is the only open file. Make your plan to get pieces out and try to double rooks and see what happens. And then, okay. But this was like a drawn game. So if we look at the bishop, bishop b6 and look for sort by black's elo and then look for like a win, a game like this might be instructive for trying to figure out how does black typically win against white here and this was one where they didn't go for the queen trade maybe that's why so when they queen trade it's going to be more likely to be a draw but when they don't notice they're making this knight e8 move so eventually they might move the king to h8 and then push f5 that's the typical maneuver um so yeah so that is what happened and this was a kind of move that this knight e8 it's a move where if you haven't seen it before, then this is really useful to know because a lot of times you, you finish your opening, your, your development, all you have, have to do is move this bishop somewhere and if you move your queen, the rooks are connected and that's as far as opening principles tell you to do. And after that, it's like, well now what? And for a long time, I didn't really understand what it meant to do because I, I know you want to um, play tactically sound, but... I didn't really know what to do when there were no tactics. And even though for most low rated players, I still don't really stress positional play because you just need to play safe moves and everyone's hanging pieces left and right. So you, even if you knew some positional play, it wouldn't help you as much. But when you're actually at a level where you're decent at tactics, and I think you are with your chess tempo rating at 1500, um, the way to plan is... Um, well, one, if you see some typical ideas, but two, there's three questions that um, Jacob Agard talks about in terms of positional planning, and that's what does my opponent want to do, where are the weaknesses, and what's my worst place piece? And so, and actually, I don't know how that fits into this knight e8 move, but this is just a typical way of improving your pieces, I guess, because um, you want to try to gain some space in the center, um, or you might not be sure where to place your pieces. But by looking at a master game and seeing this move that looks kind of unintuitive, then you start to see, well, why did they do that? Oh, it's because they want to move this pawn. Well, they can't move this pawn because the bishop is here, so that means they're eventually going to follow this up with moving the king over and then moving the pawn. So that kind of, and then they're just playing on this F file and they're pushing pawns, and now even the G pawn is pushing. So. And part of the reason they can do this is because the position is more closed. If the position was open, you wouldn't want to be moving pawns in front of the king like that. 
And then, so he's just, so Aronian is just getting an attack on it. Now, I feel like eventually this rook could probably come to g8 and start to line up against their king. But we'll see what happens. Actually, at this point, they can't because the bishop is guarding um, g8. Okay, so they do a rook lift. So with the rook lift idea, now the rook can go to g6 because, again, they can't put the rook on g8 because the bishop will take. And now they're threatening um, rook h6, which would be checkmate. So, so yeah, so that's kind of like what I would do. Like, you definitely want to try to find games by strong players and lines that you play. And just kind of look at where they are putting their pieces, even if you don't understand it. You'll start to take in some patterns subconsciously the more you do it. Especially if you play a tough game, and then early in the opening you see something in a database that says, Oh, this move is not really common. A lot of the grandmasters are typically playing this. And then just looking at a few of those games, that'll help out a lot. Now the real way to to really um, improve your positional play would be to find an annotated collection of games related to the openings you play. So just an opening book that has good um, annotations would help because they're um, covering all the games in these openings and structures and they're telling you the main plans. Also the book Chess Structures is pretty decent. Although, like, um, it's been on my list to read for a long time, and I just haven't done it. But any any kind of chess annotations are going to be helpful, especially if you try to guess the move and then and then see what's happening. All right, so let me try to find the game again. Oh, so we had this trap where, um, so you put the bishop here. And unfortunately, it falls to this pawn push, and then when a knight moves, the queen can um, fork the king and win the bishop. Now, if we actually look at um, the position from here before that mistake was made, we see that in this database, bishop b4 was played 38 times. If we sort by rating, look at that, there's a grandmaster that has fallen for it. So you're actually in good company as even grandmasters have fallen um, for this exact trap. And you see they lost a the queen, I mean lost the lost the bishop, and they eventually just lost this game. Against the 2100, so um, 2185 beat a grandmaster in this line. So that was pretty interesting. Even like there was a fide master that also fell for it. Now, I wonder how many people actually missed playing d5 though, but I mean I could look at that, but I'm not going to. Okay. Oh, also, like, for why I missed it in the game, so if I look at it from this perspective, why did I miss the tactic of pushing the pawn, knight moves, and then going for this? And I think the reason is because usually Puzzle Rush starts from, like, this position, where you just find a queen fork, and then um, they might do something like this, and then you would have to take. Or if they don't, if they don't, they just do something else. Then you would just take the bishop. Actually, I can actually show you because I have a, um, a few of these pulled up. So if you want, you can um, you can try to pause the video when I go to a new position and try to solve it. But they're all going to be pretty similar. So I mean, you don't really have to. But here they have a um, bishop right there. We can fork and try to win the bishop. Notice when we go here, the knight will be able to block, so we don't want to just go here and try to pre-move that. We want to see if they're actually going to move the knight or not, and they don't, so we just pick up the bishop. Okay, now it's a 384 rated puzzle. Now here is another one. So queen, I see this fork. And again, the knight could come here, So and if it does, we could just remove the knight like that. So there it is. So we take, and then we take the bishop. That was a 1073. But it's a very similar puzzle, so there was a big rating difference but it's still the same um, pattern. So it's just really common. So here we have this one, the knight can come here. So we'll see if it does, it does. We take, and then we just recapture the bishop. So here's another one, very similar. These are all unique positions in the tactics trainer, but you see a lot of stuff is happening on the exact same squares. And this is the importance of studying tactics and puzzle rush in particular when you're trying to do them fast, because if you can solve these fast, then, um, you're just gonna have a lot easier time getting through getting through more patterns. Like if it takes you forever to see this tactic, you're gonna be less likely to see it in a game. And notice how all of these 
they don't ask me to make this d5 move to kick the knight. They just start here, and that's part of why, like I said, I didn't see it. So there's another one. Oh, this one we can't take, and we don't have a, a piece that could remove the knight. So I'm guessing it's this, which attacks the rook and the knight. So this one's slightly different. And so they defend the knight, but I can take that. That was 1199. I thought that would have been higher. But okay, so let's go back to the to the game. And G takes here. So you also made a comment about um how you you weren't able to get the rook to g8 and um because um you were on defensive. And that's definitely true, but you what happened was um so looking at the with with the engine, this pawn capture was a mistake. And so even though the material is even, you're already kind of losing at this point. Um which is really hard to see, like if you're just a human trying to figure out what's going on. Um, it's, it can be kind of intuitive because you are weakening your pawns, you're doubling them. Um, and like I said, you don't want to castle king side this way, so you have to castle queen side, and then it depends on whose attack will prevail. But even with that, when you're trying to attack, trying to get the rook here at the key moment would be probably helpful. Um, Although, it, like, if I look at it with the engine, I feel like, okay, this pawn could fall, and it's, it's not really that that simple, but, like, if I was playing as black against someone, I would definitely be trying to do that and double rooks on the g-file to try to attack and then pushing pawns. Because, yeah, they can play g3, like you said, but it's still, the rook is not doing anything on h8, and on g8, even though, like, well, one g3 is a weakening move because you're moving a pawn in front of the king so you're opening up things plus like i said this f pawn is pinned so at some point if the h pawn ever moves then sacrificing on g3 would work out because they can't recapture so there's a lot going for you in terms of piece coordination like if you just play like rook g8 here for instance um, now with the computer it's not really the top engine move but um, but that's kind of like the idea because what you did is you moved the bishop and then you trade the bishop for a knight. Like the bishop would have been definitely better here, and just try to pile up and try to attack the king. Um, and a lot of uh, positional play is just putting pressure on certain areas that are likely to be weak, because that's how tactics happen. Like they flow from superior position. That's like Bobby Fischer quote. And um, because in the game, like your pieces were had to be really passive while mine were active in attacking the king and it's just because you didn't really have any counterplay after that um and so i did find a game like i looked through the chess base and saw let me see is it this one yes this one's on Neronian game and it actually that's not to move it actually features a similar structure i'll show it from white's perspective first so at this point, because I, I looked for games that had the same material breakdown and the same rook here and bishop here. And so you see how similar this is to say this. It's not the exact same position. Oh, wait. It was. But this position in our game versus like this position is it's pretty simple. The pawns are in different squares, but the piece break down and the pressure that black has against white's king is like what I was um, trying to, to say you should try to focus for. So we just look at like what black does here. Um, so cg3 is moved, but then um, black kind of plays against that. So they move the rook to attack the queen, queen moves. They bring another rook, so they're doubling rooks on the semi-open file in front of black's king. And notice this rook was on the only other semi-open file because there's a pawn here and there's no pawn that um that black has on this file. So they move the rook from one good square to another and then um and now you can see like they might start pushing h5 and try to get the pawn to h4 and then when you take like that's just going to open things up because now with the king on h1 they can't take back with the h pawn and they moved um I think they moved from g1 in part because they want to be able to recapture with the f pawn if black were to um were to sacrifice the rook because actually at this point maybe this is the threat like 
if it was like black's move again you see like this is actually a good move so they take and you're winning the queen because they can't recapture it back so that's like what i'm saying like when you want to put the rook on g on a g pile even though yeah they can go g3 but then that's creating a weakness now you have a thing to attack that's how positional play is done like you create weaknesses and then you try to attack them um okay now I think that might be it for that one game. Yeah, that's pretty much all I'm gonna talk about there. But let me see, what, what are my notes? What do I have? Oh, I was gonna say, I do like that you annotated the game and added some comments. Like that's definitely something um, I think a lot of coaches would appreciate in students uh, because as, um, it just gives a coach more data to work with like they understand what they were thinking about rather than seeing the moves because sometimes you might miss something in chess because you just didn't see the idea and in other cases you might not play a thing because you saw it but then you thought there was some problem with it so um the actual reason for the mistake is actually really key in those situations to to diagnose what you should work on because if it's just missing ideas, then you need to be exposed to that idea more in a different ways, how it works, how it doesn't. But then, um, and just similar in the other situation. So, and in terms of like, how do you actually learn from a game? Like, what do you take away? How does it stay in your memory? And the way I recommend, and this is, I've read in some Bresky books, is you want to like, Create a personal file of things that you learned in chess. So instructor positions. So um, like you might take a game that's annotated and just look at it occasionally, or you take a position from that game where a key decision was missed, and then test yourself, try to find what it was, and have an explanation. And that way, when you look at it, like every few months or so, then you're you'll be more likely to remember it. And also, when you get more examples, you can add it next to that example and be able to compare and contrast them similar to how i showed that like puzzle rush tactic i saved a whole lot of similar ones so i can compare and contrast when it works and when it doesn't and um and you you want to do that with your games too like just try to find like one area one area in the game where you learn something and then just add it you can similarly you can do this with um games you study so if you study an annotated game just pick like one or two areas where you learn something and then just create a study for it, like in Lee Chess. You, there is the option for Chess.com library, but I don't think it's nearly as good as the Lee Chess study feature, unfortunately. Um, so, I, was, I don't know if I was gonna show that off here or not, but, but I do just recommend like making a study because then you can just add chapters and um, you got like 64 chapters in a study, but you can have as many, um, many studies as you want. So I definitely recommend um, some of the, actually I was gonna show that off because I did take a look at one of your games. Um, and so this is gonna be like a game that you also, I took a look at the game you won earlier too. That was a um, good job. But in this game, it was pretty interesting. So at this point, you're in a tough situation. So for everyone watching, pause the video and um, figure out what you would do for um, white here. Okay, so the problem with um, your end in this position is that they're attacking your queen and they are attacking the rook. And if you move the queen out the way like you do in the game, you're, you just lose the rook. Now you're still doing okay, um, like you're not losing. But at this point, white's actually winning if they find the best continuation. Because if we look at the material count, white is up plus four. So the key to get out of this situation is actually to move bishop g5. And this one was a, like a surprising move to me. Like I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't really trying to calculate when looking at the position, but this idea was like, I don't think I've seen many of these um, situations. I actually did a position search on Lee Chess Tactics and actually found some where it's very similar where this bishop is attacking the queen and the rook, and bishop here is the only way to save it. And the idea here here is, if they take the rook, then you just win a queen. And if they take the queen, well now you're just trading queens. 
because you took off queens and then took off the bishop assignment. So now you're still at plus four. So that was a way that you could have won this game. But you go here, and then that kind of gives away the advantage. So now they're up a rook. I mean, you are up a rook here because you took on a8. But now they kind of got the rook back because you let them take on h1. Now, okay, so here you're just in an even position. But we start to see the, the importance of the blunder check um, come up soon. And also, this is going to be a very different game than the one that we played. Because the one that we played, I put a lot of positional pressure on you. That's the only way that... Um, the engine said I was plus two without you losing any material. And those games are harder to really learn from and kind of correct. Like, a tactical mistake is very easy to see and understand and try to remember that pattern. And that's also why I recommend when you're playing to try to improve, you want to play people that are slightly higher rated than you. Um, it's like no more than 200 points for optimal, like, learning because you still have a chance to win. But And they're not going to beat you so bad that every it, they just eliminate every weakness that you have because then you don't really have a chance but you do have chances against um people that are slightly better and then you just repeat the process you eventually get to a new rating level and then 200 points higher than you is going to be higher than it was before and that's pretty much how like i got better i just played people within 200 points of me or i used to actually just set it to 100 points 100 lower and just do that um so here, but here we see like typical tactical um, mistakes. So here you go bishop b8 and do a blunder check. What is the problem with this? What blunder check says, you want to look at all checks, captures, and threats. They have a bishop check, and that bishop check will allow them to take the bishop. So this game was lost just because of that. And after that, there's really no way to save it unless they just blunder back um, terribly. And against like stronger and stronger players, it's just not enough to win. And this was a 1392 rated player, so it might have been one of your best wins if you were able to pull it off. And it was within reach, like if you had saw the bishop g5 move earlier, or at least you wouldn't have lost and had a better chance to draw if you didn't um, lose the bishop. Because now they just are able to trade pieces, they have a rook on the 7th, or the 2nd in this case. But you still just call it the 7th rank, it's kind of what most, most people know it by. And you just lose all your pawns. And because they have that extra bishop, there's nothing you can do. So you're just um, losing that game. So what I would do, like, like if you wanted to learn and remember. So this would be like the first case that I make a study of in this game. So what I'll do is I will download, copy the PGN, go to this study. Oh, I didn't want to invite people. Add a chapter. Paste the PGN. So now we have the game in here. I'm just going to delete the initial default chapter. So now we have this game in here, and I want to go to that position. So this position. Go to add a new chapter, and then go to the editor. So here you can actually set the position up and move things if you want it. But when you do it lo from a loaded game, you can just um, you can just have the position right here, so you don't have to. Um, recreate everything from scratch. And here you can change it if you want it like from blacks orientation or whites, which is super useful. Not even chess base has this feature. And I can't believe more places don't do this by default. Like it's just useful. Like if you're studying stuff from the black side or you play a game and you were black, then being able to instantly click on a game and have it loaded from black's perspective is huge. So I can't believe any other chess website isn't doing that yet. So um so yeah, so now we have this chapter two, which just starts from this position. And you want to go here, because if they take, you just want a queen. And I can go here and make a comment. It's a queen. And here we are just trading. Oops. This leads to trades. So white is still winning. And then you, you could also like add your move and then annotate it and say um, blunder, missed a win. Or there's all kind of like possibilities for, for you to do stuff. And, and that's pretty much like all you need. You can 
um, title it to if you want, or just have a study that has a collection of tactics or positional play or from a specific opening. But the, the main thing that you want to do is start recording these key instructive moments because you're going to forget them if you don't. It's like watching a lecture but not taking any notes. Or watching a YouTube video and not taking any notes. And that's what most people do and that's partly what I want to start to have my channel geared towards is getting you guys into the habit of doing more serious chess training. That's if you're trying to like really improve and maximize your time and effort and have the best chance at getting better. Because a lot of people like they'll give up on their goals in chess but then they're not doing this like if you're doing this you have a better chance at memorizing stuff like i showed you before um like all these end game records and actually some of them i have to um i have to re-get for the daily but look at this you want to know the secret of how i got good at the end games i have studies for every single end game so queen versus rook i have all my analysis for moves that i would play in every single situation and i just memorize it because i had them in the study if you're not like um, logging this information anywhere, it's going to be very difficult for you to just naturally memorize it all. But you can organize things, and that's really a big push for how you get better at chess. And it's a lot of like the Russians back in the day, they used to do similar stuff, but they used to have like note cards and stuff. So like notebooks filled with positions and do this. So they have to do it like a lot manually through by hand. But with Lee Chess Studies, you actually have like everything you need and again i've tried the library feature i could try it again and do a comparison video to see if anything has improved but um but yeah also chess base works in a similar way because you can just like i saved this game and i saved a ronin game after so you can do that but the thing is chess base is expensive Lee chess is free and in the cloud so um if i had to recommend something it really is just Lee chess for the study feature like i definitely like playing on chess.com and i like to use a lot of other features and there's all kind of debates on should you buy premium or not um but but overall like i try to find the best tools for the job and i don't mind using any specific website so there was a time where i thought it made more sense for me to how long have i been going i've been rambling there was a time where i made been thinking about like okay I'm really good at these end games a lot of people are finding my channel and stuff it makes sense to only post chess.com content and try to get partnered there because they'd be more likely to promote my stuff and I can grow but um but I think overall in terms of making a chess improvement channel that tries to talk about things people don't always talk about as often um it's impossible to do that while only sticking to chess.com ecosystem so you're going to be seeing a lot of different websites, a lot of different training methods and stuff over time. And I'll definitely give my reasons why and honest reviews for these things, because I'll just recommend what I personally use. So and that's kind of what you're seeing today. So, um, so yeah, so that's that. Now, so we have this first study. I'll just read, I'll just name it Tactic 1. So this was definitely a way to, and if I look at the engine, I can see that um, bishop g5 was definitely a good move. And queen here is still winning, actually. Oh, I didn't miss a win. Missed a better win. Missed a more convincing win, I'll say. Oops. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, now... So this is the full game again, and we can go to that other place, so here. And at this point, they found this move. And actually, if we look at the, with the engine analysis here, you were, it was even. And this move alone puts you almost down a queen, like eight, minus 8.3. Like, not a technical queen, but like a relative piece value queen. So, so what I would do, and this is similar to like um, the kind of mistake that I'm targeting in the blunder check series. Is that I'm going to make a position right before you made this move. Um, okay, where is it? Oh, so it's this, and then create chapter, orientation white, blender check. And actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make I'm gonna make this study public so people can actually find it. Um, what do I name it? Um, creating leeches studies. 
All right, so now at this point, so we have this game and I want to make the comment before making the move. So um, bishop b8 fails the blunder check because of bishop h6 check. Um, and I guess that's a discovered attack or I don't know what it is. Well, the bishop. So just you just make some kind of note, whatever you want to do, like it doesn't have to be exactly this. But you do want to show the variation that it led to um losing the bishop. You can even draw arrows and it'll it'll save. Um just you have to be careful about um if you click on the board you'll lose your arrows. So you could do like Nakamura and have a million arrows going everywhere, but then one click and they're all gone. So I don't really use arrows in studies that much. Because I'll just accidentally delete one and, and feel upset about it. But yeah, so here here it is. We have two instructive moments from your games. And actually if you go in between like games like this, it'll be left off at the place you are at. So if you um, refresh the page, wait. So you go to the beginning of one and then refresh the page, then all of them will start from the beginning position. So that's like one tip for that. And then, so I just look at the, the first tactic, here it is. And you just try to think about the position, what you would do, and just try to train yourself to see, oh, you go here quickly. Um, you don't go here because you just lose the rook, but this forces a trade of queens. Or if they don't trade the queen, then you just win their queen. And so just like that, it takes like 10 seconds to go through this puzzle. Or when you're more advanced, it could take two seconds to just see this puzzle and immediately recall the solution and, and what's going on. And then in this one, um, maybe you make it the title, um, Blunder Check Bishop B8. So yeah, so Blunder Check Bishop B8. So then when you look at the position, you just don't look at the annotations or anything. You just look at Bishop B8 and try to find what's wrong with it. And what's wrong with it, you should see it's that winning the bishop. If you look at this position like every day for like a week or something and then um, like look at it once every couple weeks or something like that, just like space repetition it, then eventually you'll start to see this idea a lot more or it'll just make you more alert because it's an idea that you miss, but like a lot of these things, they're repeatable. So, um, so when people have like habits, they, it's definitely hard to like break those habits, even if you've seen it and you understand it and you learned it. If you go a long time without looking at it again, and you haven't experienced an idea like this in a while, then you're gu guaranteed to almost repeat it again. So if you look at it a lot and you immediately see, oh, they have this winning this, then you're going to be much less likely to make that mistake in the future, and that will just make you a better player. So the goal is to fill up a chapter, get 64 positions like this, where you um, where you find places where you went wrong and just add the correction in, and then just train to see those corrections like faster and faster until you can do it like within three seconds, you can go through a position. Now, if you have like a really complicated calculation thing, that would take a little bit more time, but, um, but you kind of get the idea that you want to train so that you see things like quickly within reason. Like if it was a one move blunder, like you made a move that fell for a, a pin or just losing your queen, that's the one you want to be able to do in like a second or something. Just, just think in terms of like puzzle rush, how fast the top people go for some of these puzzles. And, um, and that's really just all you want to do. So another goal of like my, um, my, notion website thing and youtube channel will be to create a lot of puzzles like this that other people can train on at specific rating ranges so it's like making um material that could go in a book but just making it all free that people can just um access okay so now we've been going for like 49 minutes we covered a lot um i think in terms of like future series i'm gonna be doing the blunder check and and then Eventually, I'll, I'll start adding some other things in, but the coaching stuff is going to take a pause for now. And hopefully this video kind of talks about a little about where I would have been going with the coaching stuff is to try to get people to start utilizing the study feature on Lee Chess to save instructional um, positions that they encounter and 
and that this is the way that you actually retain stuff in your memory is by like logging it and then reviewing it, ideally testing yourself on it. So like covering up the moves and then trying to recall what the idea of this position is. That would be like the best um, use of your time for um, improvement. So hope you enjoyed. See you in the next one.